Hello, and welcome to uh, Introduction to Experimental Designs. This is the first in a number of online lectures I'll be doing for my research methods class. So welcome everyone. Hopefully we'll be able to learn a lot and uh, keep our class going. So what we're going to be talking about today as we move from discussions of observational and survey designs is talking about experiments. And we've talked a little bit about experimental design already. But I want to spend a few minutes today talking about what makes an experiment, talk about the relationship between experimental designs and causality, talk about some basics of experimental psychology, introduce the, the concept of confounds and experimental control. The next lecture will be entirely on confounds and experimental control. And then finally, we'll finish up with uh, some discussion of different types of experimental designs. So let's start with what makes an experiment. An experiment is a test of a cause and effect relationship, which we can establish by collecting evidence to demonstrate the effect of one variable on another. So the biggest difference between the other types of research designs we've talked about and this one is we can actually establish a cause and effect relationship by manipulating an independent variable and seeing how it gets or has an effect on a dependent variable. And assuming we've done everything correct, any change or lack of change in the um, dependent variable will be due to the independent variable. So this is a critical part of understanding how we're able to establish that causality. So the essential characteristics of an experiment include preferably the random selection of subjects from a research pool. This is probably the biggest failure of most experiments in that we kind of end up with who we end up with. And we've talked in class about how a number of problems with uh, psychological research is it tends to involve what we call weird subject, those from Western uh, societies, which are industrial, educated, rich, um, and democratic. And so um, we tend to have a little bit of difficulty in that, but the perfect experiment, we would have random selection of subjects. We always randomly assign subjects to conditions, and in a separate video, I've recently talked about how important it is that we randomly assign subjects in drug trials, because we want to make sure that we aren't biasing those drug trials by assigning certain individuals to certain conditions. So, if, for example, we might assign someone we think is more likely to benefit from a drug to a drug condition rather than to a placebo condition. So you always randomly assign subjects to conditions so that there is no potential bias for how uh, an experimental result comes out. We want to make sure that any um, individual subject differences are randomly distributed throughout the experiment. And we'll talk about the importance of that when we talk about between subjects designs uh, here in a couple of lectures. The other important thing, of course, is that we have some genuine experimental manipulation. Later in the term, we're going to talk about what are called quasi-experimental designs. And in a quasi-experimental design, you might not have as much control or you might not actually be able to manipulate uh, the actual experimental variable. So oftentimes we're interested, for example, in sex and gender differences. And those are things we can't actually manipulate, but we might be interested in their effects on a dependent variable anyway. So we call that a quasi-experimental design. Finally, we want to maintain experimental control. And this is also critically important that we take tight control over the environmental conditions, the precise nature in which our stimuli are presented. We want everything to be as precise and exact and as similar as possible throughout the experiment, except for, of course, our intentional manipulation. So the next thing we get uh, interested in discussing uh, is exactly how that causality is established. And I want to talk about the method of agreement and difference. And this is something that was established by John Stuart Mill. And then we'll talk about how we manipulate uh, independent variables and measure dependent variables uh, after that. So the method of agreement and difference, as I said, was established by John Stuart Mill. And according to Mill, Suppose one is interested in determining what factors play a role in causing a specific effect, which we'll call E, under a specific set of circumstances. The method of agreement tells us to look for factors present on all occasions when an effect occurs. So we'll pause for a second and consider that. So the method of agreement says that if something is causing 
uh, an effect, it has to be present all of the time. The method of difference tells us to look for some factor that is present on some occasion when an effect occurs and is absent on an otherwise similar occasion when it does not. So if that effect occurs in the presence of something and does not occur in the absence, we would call that the method of difference. The joint method of agreement and different combines these previous two methods. And this is what we do in experiments. <coughs> By holding all things con constant, we use the method of agreement, that is, all things are the same. Then by manipulating an independent variable, we use the method of difference. So we establish the agreement and the difference in this type of experiment. And as a result, if we test two or more groups of subjects, which differ only in one respect in their treatment, that independent variable, any observed differences in their performance can then be attributed to the different treatment. So as I was saying, sorry, I had to stop and let the dogs out. Um, anytime we observe a difference in performance, we can attribute it to that different treatment, provided we have held all things constant. So one of the things we always want to talk about doing is making sure that we're holding everything constant and the only difference is in our independent variable. So that gets us to this question of manipulation and measurement. So manipulation is a critical part of any experiment. We manipulate an independent variable or more than one independent variable and then we observe the effect on behavior as measured by the dependent variable. We then measure our target behavior or our construct using dependent variables. And it's really important to understand that the measurement we are engaging is a dependent variable. The thing we're interested in observing is usually our construct. So memory might be a construct. Our dependent variable could be recognition memory, free recall, cube recall, uh, picture recall, all sorts of different ways in which we might um, manipulate, or sorry, we might measure that target construct of memory. Similarly, something like spatial ability uh, or uh, visual spatial ability can be measured with a variety of different measures. So the construct would be visual spatial ability. The uh, dependent variable might be the Vandenberg and Q's test of mental rotation. It could be um, one of the other tests of mental rotation. It could be um, a variety of um, sort of visual uh, visualization techniques in which uh, we actually measure how long it takes somebody to visualize, say, moving from one part of an island to another, which is a classic Steve Coslett experiment. Um, we might actually give them 3D objects to manipulate to try to match um, other objects. So there are a number of different ways that we can measure that target behavior, um, which is important. So those are the first established basics. I want to spend a few minutes talking about both independent and dependent variables, talk about floor and ceiling effects, and then validity and reliability. So the first is uh, an independent variable. And independent variables are, of course, those things that we're manipulating. We talk about an independent variable having multiple levels. So obviously, an independent variable has to have at least two levels. So for example, if we had a drug and placebo condition, we might um, end up with um, two levels of a single independent variable. That would be independent variable would be drug. The two levels would be zero and say 10 milligrams of the drug. We could then add a 20 milligram condition, so we would have three levels, 0, 10, and 20 milligrams. We could go to four levels, 0, 10, 20, 30, et cetera. So independent variables can have a number of different levels that are uh, parametrically uh, manipulated, that is they're manipulated quantitatively by their amount, or they can even be qualitative. So for example, in uh, memory experiments, we might have somebody uh, read words, hear words or um, see words with pictures, see pictures on their own. There are a number of different ways in which we might manipulate that independent variable. First thing we want to think about is we want to try to avoid what we call a sledgehammer independent variable. And a sledgehammer independent variable is one in which we have so dramatically um, manipulated our independent variable that there's no way we're not going to get an effect. Um, so for example, if we were interested in alcohol intoxication in memory and our level of alcohol was so high that our subjects were incoherent, that doesn't tell us much about alcohol in memory. It just tells us that we've made our subjects incoherent. 
Uh, so we want to be very careful and watch out for that sledgehammer independent variable. And some of the experiments um, I've been involved with, we use a drug called midazolam or Versed to manipulate memory. And it's a bit of a sledgehammer independent variable because it inevitably causes a significant decline in memory. And so we have to be very cautious in interpreting those kinds of results with a sledgehammer independent variable. We also want to make sure that we're not using such minute manipulations that we're not able to detect any differences at all. And so this is a bit of a delicate balance between sort of micro manipulations that don't tell us anything and sledgehammer independent variables that don't tell us much either. So first thing we can do is we can of course use several different levels to determine um, the effects of an independent variable. But one of the things I always um, advise people to do is to conduct a pilot study, to calibrate their independent variable to the level at which uh, they're getting the response that they want so that it can be meaningful for whatever their uh, hypothesis might be. That gets us to dependent variables. Uh, often we use a number of dependent variables because they can illustrate different aspects of a single construct. So while we might be interested in memory, we might um, measure memory in a variety of different ways. To give you an example, um, in um, memory experiments, we can use a variety of memory tests. Oftentimes we use what's called free recall, in which case we just simply ask people to write down as many words as they can remember. Or we might use recognition memory, where participants are asked to try to recognize which items were presented on a previous memory test uh, and which ones were not. We might also use a cued recall type of test. This can take on a variety of, um, of forms. So for example, we might have paired cued recall where items were presented as word pairs in the beginning, or participants might be asked um, to recall all the animals that were presented on a study list, or all the plants, uh, all the proper names, something like that. What's important to understand is we can observe differential effects of an independent variable using these different dependent variables. So for example, in the memory literature, there is a phenomenon called the word frequency effect, and we see differential patterns of um, memory performance if we use free recall versus a recognition memory test. So it's important to understand that you can get at different aspects of the same construct by using a different dependent variable. A couple other issues with how we design an experiment. The first is what we call a floor effect. This is when uh, performance is too low to detect differences. That is, performance is at the bottom of the scale. So we've made our task too difficult, and our participants are simply unable to perform well enough for us to detect any differences. And so we want to watch out for this kind of floor effect because performance is so terrible that we're not making, we're not able to distinguish between conditions then that's not telling us anything. So that means that we probably have a task that's just too difficult for participants to accomplish. And so we're gonna have to adjust accordingly. Uh, the opposite of that is a ceiling effect where performance is too high or near the top of the scale to detect differences. Uh, this can happen oftentimes in um, short-term memory tasks if we've made them too easy. So for example, there is a task called the digit span task uh, where you can get both floor and ceiling effects. Um, so pretty much two to four digits, participants are gonna get um, those digit span tasks 100% correct. You get up to nine and 10 digits, you might get a few participants getting those correct, but get to 12, 13, 14, 15 digits, no one's gonna get those correct. And so uh, you can get both ceiling and floor effects, and so you wanna try to calibrate these kinds of measures so that you're getting the kind of results that you want. So again, the solution here, is to pilot test your measures prior to launching an experiment so that you can make sure that um, participants are able to accomplish the task and you're gonna get meaningful results. So the last part of these basics I wanna talk about are both validity and reliability. We'll start with reliability. It's very simple in an experimental context. This refers to the consistency or stability of an experimental effect. This basically means that we should, if an effect is reliable, we're gonna get it all the time. And so uh, this is where we start to question a number of experimental findings because they're not necessarily that reliable. So a classic case of this is 
Um, there are sex and gender differences in mental rotation tasks um, that are sometimes found and sometimes not found. It's not a very reliable finding. So you find those sex differences sometimes, but not other times. And so that makes us question whether or not that's a real finding because we're not getting at it all the time. There are, it turns out, some systematic reasons behind that lack of reliability, um, which have to do with hormones, body composition, and all sorts of other individual differences. But that's just not a reliable finding, and that's important. The internal validity of an experiment occurs when we can establish that cause and effect relationship by eliminating plausible alternative causes. So we don't have to eliminate every possible cause in an experiment. We just have to eliminate those that are plausible. And so by designing a good experiment, we can usually end up with um, good internal validity and establishing a cause and effect relationship. And this finally gets at this issue of experimental control. That key to internal validity is to have strict control over conditions and to make sure we've accounted for as many possible external variables as possible. So I want to introduce the idea of confounds again in a um, future uh, video. I'll be discussing confounds and experimental control in more detail. So I'll be looking for that. Uh, confounds are any extraneous variable which can cause an unattended effect on our results. This can be that we have um, differences between groups in a between subjects design. So we have more males in one group and more females in another, or we have more seniors in one group and more freshmen in another group. Um, any potential extraneous variable which can cause an unintended effect on our results. Technically, we refer to confounds as competing with our independent variable for explaining our dependent variable. And so when we talk about confounds, they're essentially, they're trying to explain our, our results rather than our independent variable. And remember, we want the only explanation for any change in our dependent variable to be that independent variable. And so that confound is competing with that explanation, and therefore it's making it harder to make that cause and effect relationship. Finally, we often will include a control condition to account for potential confounds. So. One of the things we often will do in an experiment is include a condition where participants don't get any of the experimental variable. In a drug trial, this would be a placebo condition where they're not getting the experimental um, drug, but they're getting um, a sugar pill or a lactase pill, something that isn't the drug itself. So they're actually part of a control condition so we can see if the drug is having an effect um, rather than just simply time is passing, people are getting better. That's happening a lot with uh, drugs used to treat the COVID-19 disease or the coronavirus. Uh, there are drugs that are being tried, but they're not being tried in conjunction with a control condition, and so we don't really have any good data on those drugs. So to wrap this up, I want to introduce the sort of three different types of experimental designs we'll talk about. The first are within subjects designs. In this case, the independent variable is manipulated within subjects. Uh, essentially, we have one group of people, and all subjects are in all conditions of our experiment. So we have one group of people, and they're all participating in all of the experiment. In a between-subjects between design, the independent variable is manipulated between groups of subjects. That is, each level of an independent variable has a different group of subjects. So when we get into factorial designs, this can lead to very large numbers of subjects if we have a different group of subjects in each level of each independent variable. So essentially we have in a simple two condition experiment, we have one group that receives placebo, one group that receives a drug. And within subjects design, we would have the subjects stay on placebo for a period of time, then get switched to a drug or be on the drug and then get switched to placebo so they would get tested in both conditions. In a mixed design, this would include both within and between subjects manipulations. And so in this kind of design, we might have one independent variable that is manipulated within subjects and another that's manipulated between subjects. And so we might have a drug trial where we have a placebo group and a drug group, but then we have a second independent variable um, that's manipulated within a group. So type of um, study material, for example, something like that. So these three different in, uh, experimental designs all have their unique concerns and questions and problems and statistics, and we're going to get into those in future lectures. So stay tuned for that. Thanks.